We praise you, loving God, that you are with us and your love is eternal. You have built your church on the rock of Jesus and on the words Peter spoke. You continue to build your church today. May our time of worship today be a time of building, building your hopes and dreams into our lives. Amen. my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that Thou art. You are my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, Your presence my life. Be thou my wisdom, thou my true word, I ever with thee am thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I thy Son, Thou in me dwelling, and I with Thee one. I crave not no man's earthly praise thou mine inheritance now and always you and you only be first in my heart high king of heaven my treasure thou art King of glory, when victory is won, may I reach heaven, O bright heaven, sun, heart of my own heart, whatever be fall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Still be my vision reading this morning is um, from Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, Romans chapter 12, reading from verses 1 to 8. I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 
for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually we are members one to another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in, in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The second reading is from Matthew's Gospel, um, Matthew chapter 16, reading verses 13 to 20. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Thank God for these readings from his word. Jesus said to his disciples, who do others say that I, the son of man, am? The answer, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. The others think in terms of the past. They see Jesus as a prophet, just like in the past. They have no new vision for their future. It's like they're living in the past, yearning for what has already gone and have no interest in anything new or different. So Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And he's actually putting the disciples on the spot. Simon was spokesman for the other disciples, probably because he spoke first and thought afterwards, possibly not giving the others a chance to speak. And after his declaration, the others would not have dared to disagree. You are the Christ, the son of the living God, says Simon. This may have been an idea that Simon had been thinking about for some time, maybe slowly growing in his mind, or it may have been one of those sudden light bulb moments. We don't know and it doesn't matter. Jesus said that God had given Simon the insight. That's what counts. The Christ or Christos meant anointed. People were anointed to set them apart for their work maybe as prophet or priest or king, anointing indicated that God had chosen them for that role. You are the Christ. Simon was declaring that Jesus was the one that Israel had been waiting for. Someone like King David of old. Someone to make Israel great again. Someone who would save Israel from the Romans. Someone sent from God to build up a great army and lead a rebellion against their oppressors. By this time, the disciples had spent, had spent quite some time with Jesus after living their lives when Jesus first called them. They must have learned a great deal by then, all new 
and with an emphasis which was foreign to their previous thinking. And yet they were still waiting for the great and glorious day when Jesus would lead an army to overthrow the Romans and set himself up as king. They believed that the uprising was imminent and they were ready to stand with Jesus, especially Simon. They too were living in the past. Despite the teachings, the miracles, all the different ways Jesus had been showing and demonstrating, the disciples were still looking for a King David-like warrior king. The story is set in Caesarea Philippi, gentle territory, Gentile territory, and they were probably surrounded by lifeless idols. So when someone said Jesus is a son of the living God, he may have been comparing the God of Israel with the gods in the area. Simon and the disciples may have been wrong about their beliefs for the future of the kingdom of God, but by declaring their allegiance, they were stating that, stating that they were willing to fight with Jesus for, for the cause. Simon and the other disciples were re ready to give their all in Jesus' service. They may have misunderstood, but they were committed. So who do you, my fellow congregation members, say that Jesus is? We've all heard many words and names to describe Jesus. Some biblical, some lay, some personal, and some communal. Words like Lord and Saviour, the Son of God, God incarnate, Counselor, my life, brother, friend, rock, the way, the truth, and the life, comforter, teacher, guide. And I'm sure you could add more. We sang some in the song a few moments ago. Peter was known for jumping in and speaking first and thinking later, or maybe not even thinking at all, a bit like a bull in a china shop. And we might laugh condescendingly at Peter's attitude, but are we really any different? Do we ever glibly say, Jesus is my friend or saviour, guide or brother, etc., without thinking about what we are really saying and what it really means? Jesus, however, thinks out his answers carefully and responds to Simon's declaration with a commitment of his own. You will be Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. And we know with wonderful insight, hindsight that on the day of Pentecost, it was Peter who stood up and preached so convincingly that thousands turned to Jesus that day, and that was just the beginning. We know the church was born that day and that it has grown and developed and changed over the centuries since through times of trials, persecutions, wars, and through times of peace and ease. But who do we say Jesus is today when faced with millions of people and growing affected, with the world, affected worldwide by the coronavirus? When we or people we know and love are faced with diagnoses of terminal illnesses? When people are sleeping in the streets for lack of affordable housing? when people flee their homes and everything that, that they are familiar with and hold dear following oppression, wars, and all natural disasters. It's easy to see Jesus in a baby's smile and first giggle, in a magnificent waterfall, in the pristine bush, in a gift or assistance from an unexpected source, in happy family gatherings or in a rainbow. But how are we, Jesus, hands, feet and smile in a world full of people, a world of people full of fear, illness, separation, loneliness and depression. Jesus renames Simon to Peter and predicts he will build his church on that rock. That rock and the words Peter spoke, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And we are part of that church, a church that has changed and morphed many times over the centuries often forced to, to change by outside influences like persecution and war. And we, as a church, are being forced to change again due to another outside influence, the restrictions resulting from COVID-19 pandemic. So what does it mean to be the church in 2020? And what will it mean to be the church in 2021 and 2022 and so on? How are we fulfilling Jesus' mission today? Jesus' mission to heal the brokenhearted to set the captives free and to lift up the oppressed. How can we set the captives free when we feel that we are captives ourselves in our homes and our venturing out into the world is limited? How can we lift up the oppressed when we need to stand 1.5 metres away from them? How can we heal the brokenhearted 
when we feel our hearts are broken? How do we continue to do all that Jesus has commanded of us when our lives have been turned upside down by an invisible and extremely infectious, infectious enemy? Something we can't see, yet we know is real and dangerous. When we have trouble staying afloat, how do we share Jesus' vision? I suspect that it is in the sharing, the doing and the being that we will be safe from ourselves and our loss, our depression and our loneliness. I know that we have all been doing something and, that, and that's great. Our congregation is a very caring and very busy congregation. However, we also need the being, the being with Jesus, the giving of Jesus, and we need to receive. Sometimes it's easier to be busy doing and giving, and we don't stop to allow Jesus to give us what we need in our spirit and in our minds. A Romans reading today spoke of the spiritual gifts. We need to learn to use the gift that God has blessed us with. It's not good to waste what God has given us. And I believe that our church has never needed us to use our gifts more. However, in these new and unexpected times, maybe some of our gifts are not as, all, as useful as they were. After all, we don't need to arrange flowers in the church right now. And that's fine with me. I have absolutely no creative talent and the arranging flowers was never my forte. But we need to look to God to see if God will provide or has already provided new gifts, new gifts that we haven't recognized or used yet. Maybe this time, this is a time of developing new gifts as well as developing new ways of worshiping God. We are coming to recognize that we may never worship again as we have in the past. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. God believes in renewal and this time can be a time of renewal and of growing, of leaving our past and our traditions behind and trusting in God to teach us to be the church that God wants us to be, instead of a church where we are comfortable consumers of what has always been offered. Jesus said he would build his church on Peter and on Peter's words. Our church is still built on those words. Jesus is still the Christ, the son of the living God. What new skills and new gifts is God offering you to use in the new look church God is building? Let's pray. Thank you, loving God, that we can come together still, despite the restrictions forced on us. Thank you for opening our minds to new ideas and ways of worshipping you. I pray that we will all be open to hearing from you and to learning from you, learning how you want your church to grow, learning what part you want each of us to take within our church and what gifts you have given each of us and are giving each of us to use for your glory and for your kingdom wherever we are. Give us all a new vision of your church and give us a renewed energy to live out your faith in our community. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning in the prayers of the people, I'm using and a prayer I've adapted from the Reverend Bruce Pruer, and he has another name for God, Holy Friend. So let us pray. It is not easy, Holy Friend, praying for our worldwide neighbours unless we trust you with our own lives. And what is harder, completely trusting you with the lives of our loved ones. Therefore, we pray that you will increase our faith and embolden us to pray and live by it. Loving God, teach us to trust you and to have to love our neighbours as we love ourselves. Holy friend, we pray for mistreated neighbours in other countries suffering from extortion and injustice political or religious oppression, cruel economic exploitation, or domestic tyranny. Holy friend, we pray for neglected neighbours, homeless, misjudged, persecuted, and hungry, or consigned to unremitting poverty, hard labour, and a short lifespan. Holy friend, we pray for 
near at hand neighbours at work, in our street, in supermarkets, shops, schools and hospitals, all who are in trouble and at their wit's end during the time of pandemic. Loving God, teach us to trust you and to have our, love our neighbours as we love ourselves. Holy friend, we pray for the neighbours in our church, the weak and the strong, the shy and the outgoing, the leaders and the followers, the newcomers and the familiar faces, those bearing secret burdens and those buoyant with happiness. Loving God, teach us to trust you and to love our neighbours as we love ourselves. Through Christ Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of working with other Christians and seeking the truth together in the name, in the name of Christ. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. <laughs>